already one of them's here hey <laughs> so welcome brandon thank you so much for joining me i'm very honored to have you on <laughs> um, um so for i mean give it, there are some people watching right now but um um i have a very very good friend uh dave schumacher that said hey you should have brandon now how masula right is that am i yeah. saying that yeah, you nailed it. Um, and I said, okay. And Dave's one of those guys where I don't have to like double check his recommendations. I just take him for what it is. <laughs> Careful on that. There he is. Hi, babe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and him and um, Tim Vickers both were a little excited about this. And I love those guys. They're like my big brother. So um, welcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, Three Tortured Souls as well. Actually, it's four, Brandon. Four, I'm sorry, Four Tortured Souls. That's right. I forgot it's that. Four. <laughs> <laughs> See? Look, hello, number four. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah I, I watch them all the time, as much as I can, at least. They're great. They are great. And mm -hmm. um, hopefully, you know, I got to meet, I got to hang out with them last year in Gettysburg. And I love them so much. And I hope they come back out, the two of them. Because I know Kenny's coming. So um, so anyway, enough about all that. Um, for the people that don't know you, um, mm -hmm. that are watching, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, can you just start where you want to start and get us to where we are right now? Because, I mean, your, your resume, if you will, CV, is pretty impressive. I like it. So. Sure. Well, thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like. I don't have a, like a typical story. I, I didn't get into this field because I had an experience or lived in a haunted house or, or any of that kind of wish I had those cool stories, but I don't. Um, right. So I kind of got into it through more um, uh, reading uh, when I was 15. Oh, Ghostbusters was my favorite movie. So that kind of got me into ghosts anyway, but um, I took a different route. I started just reading about parapsychology when I was in high school and I just, kind of got fascinated with it. And, um, you know, for, for those who don't know, uh, parapsychology uh, is basically a, the field of study concerned with investigation of paranormal and psychic phenomenon. So that's like your telepathy, your precognition, your clairvoyance, your psychokinesis, uh, near-death experiences, reincarnation, apparitional experiences, uh, survival hypothesis, that type of thing. Uh, so I went to school for psychology I uh, ended up getting a graduate degree in clinical counseling. Um, and then I went overseas to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland because there's not a lot of places in, in the U.S. that you can actually study parapsychology. Why is that? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I think... Well, to me. I, it, Are we not smart enough? <laughs> well, I, there's still a little bit of a stigma associated with parapsychology. Really? Uh, I think it's gotten better. But back, like... Um, around two, when I was going to school in, you know, 2008, 2009, something like that. Um, it wasn't uh, very popular, but nowadays if, if a, if a university puts a class on parapsychology or ghosts, it fills up like that. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's becoming more and more um, accepted, but the UK has been doing it for a long time. And, and that's where I went to the university of Edinburgh there. They have a whole university of Edinburgh is a top 25 university. That's the place where they clone the sheep. Does anyone remember like Dolly? The sheep back in 1994. Uh, well, in case we don't, 
<laughs> well, the first the first cloning took place uh, with a sheep at the University of Edinburgh. I think it was in 1994, 1995. Was it that long ago? Wow. Yep. Her name was Dolly. Um, I remember. And then Charles Darwin went to University of Edinburgh too. So it's a, it's a top 25 university and they study ghosts and parapsychology. So um, cool. So it's not, it's not as uh, stigmatized or anything over there. Everyone over there usually well, has a good story. Look how old it is, first of all. The United Kingdom is old and the bill, I mean, the, the they have, you know, they're probably way more, they probably have way more I don't know, lack of better description, but ghosts and haunted buildings and areas yep. and castles and than we do for sure. It's when you're over in the UK and it's it's I mean, the United States has kind of been around. I know it's been around longer, but really since 1700, 1776, whatever, however you want to say it. Yeah. So our history is pretty short compared to theirs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it is kind of a fascinating when you go to a university that's been around longer than the United States has actually been um, here. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's kind of a weird feeling. Yeah. Um, but you know that that was part of the experience is just being over there. And then when I was over there, I studied parapsychology. Uh, I when I was over there, I was really fascinated on uh, like why do some people have numerous ghostly encounters and other people have none. Like, what's the difference? Uh, so I did a lot of work on that and research on that. And then I came back here to the States and um, I've still been doing the ghost stuff. Uh, my my day job is is more like the clinical counseling, more the psychology part of things. But, you know, for for fun, I do the uh, write on ghosts. And I still have a couple articles that have been published uh, recently in um, Frontiers of Psychology Cornell Quarterly and Journal of Societies for Psychical Research, some articles published there. Um, so I still do the ghost stuff. Do you believe in ghosts? Uh, I do. Yeah. You do. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's good. Yeah. That's, it's you, you know, I, I think <laughs> I, it's weird coming. I'm sort of quasi academic, I say. Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, in the, I'm not a professor, I'm not teaching anything like that. But I think it's okay to admit that one believes in paranormal phenomena. Um, it doesn't mean I'm unedu uneducated. Doesn't mean I have a cognitive deficits. I'm perfectly capable of rational thinking and deduction. I didn't grow up in a house that constantly talked about ghosts. Uh, I don't recall any of my family members really talking about ghosts. So it's it's not like I'm primed for it. Um, I, I I legitimately believe the paranormal phenomenon is there. Now I I think when we say ghosts. We don't know if that's like a psi thing or like a right. thought form thing, but I do believe that there is paranormal phenomenon that we just can't really um, explain at this point. And I do kind of lean towards the idea of telepathy being real, um, crisis apparitions, those types of things. I, I do think that there's enough evidence out there to say, you know, a lot of people are having these experiences. Um, you said, did you say crisis apparitions? Yes, crisis I've never heard that term. Oh boy, crisis apparitions are the coolest thing out there. I, I've never heard this. Of yes. This. So, th this crisis apparitions are actually, to me, the most um, uh, valuable piece of evidence for um, telepathy or even ghosts. So, what cri basically crisis apparitions? Um, it's kind of a wide range of phenomenon, but what happens is you have a vision or an apparition at or near the time that a distant loved one or acquaintance was sort of dying, involved in an accident or experiencing some type of unexpected event. Um, so many people report that they've seen a, like a, a lifelike apparition of a friend or a relative at or about the time that that person was dying, involved in an accident, experiencing like um, um, a tragedy of some kind. So the, the, the example I give is, if I wake up one night at a random Tuesday night at 1 a.m. and I see the ghost of my aunt hovering above my bed and she says, I love you. And then she disappears. Mm -hmm. The next day I get a call and, and they say my aunt died last night right at the time that I had that apparition of her. Mm -hmm. That's a crisis apparition. It's spontaneous phenomenon that happens at or around the time that another person either died or was in a significant crisis event. 
Um, Can so, I ask a question? What about the people that say they get phone calls? Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of phenomenon like that too. Um, Would you is that in the same category as a crisis apparition? Yeah, they they um I can't remember the actual term, but it, it's it's more or less like they used to call it vertical hallucinations, which hallucinations doesn't mean it's psychosis or anything like that, but it's experiencing some sort of feeling or telepathic distress signal from somebody at or about the time they die. Um, Telephone calls are obviously a more modern thing. <laughs> um, right. But True. there is whole books. I think one of the books is called Telephone Calls from the Dead uh, or Phantom Messages, something along those lines. But that's kind of the same thing. You're right. Um, if it happens right at the time somebody dies or in a crisis event. And sometimes these things aren't when people actually die. There's a lot of cases where like uh, a loved one gets in a car accident and I'm just sitting at home and then I see a vision of, you know, my wife or someone, um, you know, crying or something like that. And it turns out she's crying halfway across town because she was in a car accident. Right, right. Oh, okay. So not, it doesn't always have to be surrounded by death. No, no, no. Sometimes it's crisis stuff, you know. Um, Interesting. So the, the book I wrote, The Ghost Studies, uh, is actually uh, a lot about crisis apparitions more than it is about hauntings or anything like ghostly or residuals or um, uh, that type place theory type stuff. It's more about crisis apparitions and how it's kind of similar to telepathy. So telepathy, uh, communication at a distance, this idea that, um, you know, I can communicate to you um, states away. Um, and, and sometimes they think these crisis apparitions are actually like telepathic distress signals. So it's fascinating. Um, that area is really fascinating. And they don't talk a lot about that on the TV shows because it's hard to really, you can't walk into someone's house who's just had a, a crisis apparition. Um, it's a little bit more challenging, but when you have a haunted house, it's easier to kind of walk in there and do all the readings and things like that. So, yeah. So, so do you think, any of those experiences are what we would have a basic definition of what a spirit or or a ghost is okay so you get a phone call could it be, really be have you ever come across anything where it went beyond the science of it like you couldn't oh. like like there were there were holes in data or research or something like that you know what i mean where you couldn't really fully yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I've heard experiences that, I mean, I can't really say 100% this is what it is. Um, my, my viewpoint is always that paranormal phenomenon, whether it's telephone phone call or telephone calls from the dead or crisis apparitions or haunting experiences, it's such a complex phenomenon that there's not really one answer that explains everything. Right. So, so one time it could be a natural cause. Another time it could be sort of that size stuff, that ESP, that telepathy sort of processes. Another time, you know, it, it could be something where maybe there is some sort of consciousness that survives death. There's there's something else could be going on. Um, you know, there's plenty of those things you come across where you just kind of uh, scratch your head and go, what? Uh, I don't know what that really is. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely don't believe you know, everything could be explained away by science um, right. by any means. I mean, we really don't have all the technology to, to find out everything that's going on in the world. Um, um, so I'm going to try to ask this in a non-complicated way, but... Good, thank you. I'm going to try. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I, I talk about this a lot on my show where, you know, there are people that that go and research and hunt all kinds of stuff. You have UFO people, you have Bigfoot people, you have Mothman people, you have ghost people, you have, you know, all different people that are researching different things. And a lot of times I'll say, well, how do we, how do, you know, us as humans have to put labels on everything. So I might see, and this is not true, but I'm just using this as an example. I might see a ghost standing in front of me. Okay. But then, you know, you, Brandon, might see Bigfoot. Is that just how we are perceiving it? And it's all the same thing? Or is it like, you know, because 
I, I mean, I, I can't believe as much as I love um, space and the sky and how much I meteor showers, lunar eclipses. Like I'm always looking at the night sky, never seen a UFO. Right. But then you have people that this is like um, an everyday or not every day, but a normal occurrence. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm putting myself in the environments to find ghosts. Right. Um, but like you had brought up earlier about there's people that, OK, I'm going to use Kenny Biddle as an example. I think he repels anything. <laughs> he just does not ever, you know, I mean, he hasn't had an experience yet. Um, I, don't, I, 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 mean, I am making this complicated. <laughs> Congratulations. So, like, uh, has there I, been. I, I was going to say, and I'll answer, I'll answer kind of this. I think our, our perceptions, like our sociocultural influences, and that has to do with how we're raised, um, our belief system, um, sometimes even just genetics and things like that do impact what we see. So if I see a ghost, um, my per, uh, uh, the perception of the ghost is different. So the perception of this ambiguous thing that's there is different from a child versus an adult. It's different from a Catholic versus an atheist. It's different than a believer versus a skeptic. So even if the genuine, even if the event is genuine, 100% genuine, the perception of it is different for everybody, correct? Right. So uh, what you perceive has to do with a little bit about how your sociocultural influences are. That's an important part of it. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned, um, 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 I forget, uh, uh, Kenny, Kenny Biddle, the skeptic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so th this, is, this is something where I think research is taking a little bit of a turn and because it, before it was like, in order to see a ghost, you have to be at the right place at the right time. Right. Right. So w when you start talking like that, then the idea is this ghost is this external thing that happens whether we're there or not. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think research is now saying it's not so much a uh, right person. Uh, it's not so much being in the right place at the right time. It's the right person in the right setting. Uh, so what we're finding is that there's a there's a lot of there's people that have numerous ghostly encounters and there's a difference between someone who has numerous ghostly encounters and someone who has none um that doesn't mean that a person like a, a an adamant skeptic can't have a ghostly encounter but it seems to be the majority of these occurrences are the right people in the right setting hmm. right and okay. the right people it kind of varies um there's a thing called transliminality which is just sort of this um, perceptual personality that people have that they're born with. Um, so we, we all have this, <clears throat> as we try, as, as we sort of walk around the world, we have our unconscious, we have our subconscious and we have sort of the external environment. Now our unconscious and our subconscious sometimes can be just bombarded by things that are going on in the world around us. Some of us have pretty good security guards and they keep our unconscious thoughts out of our consciousness. So what happened to me when I was two, year old, two years old doesn't start popping into my brain now, right? Right. My unconscious okay. is sort of stored in a deep part of my brain. Right. Um, some people have uh, like the security guard that keeps their conscious, their unconscious from getting inside their head. And it keeps all the sensory stuff out there as well. So I'm not bombarded by noises and smells. Uh, kind of like if you ever watch Superman. Um, he hears so much, he smells so much that he has to sort of block a lot of it out to focus on whatever he's doing. People with transliminality don't have a good security guard, so they're always bombarded by unconscious, subconscious, external stimuli. And sometimes these people have more ghostly encounters. Um, so that there's, and there's people who are really sensitive to the environment too, environmental sensitivity. And that has nothing to do with like psychic sensitivity. It's more or less just people who, um, you know, um, have severe allergies or migraines or fibromyalgia or uh, um, sensitivity to chemicals and smells. These people have way more paranormal experiences than the general population. So we're finding that it's sort of like the right people uh, genetically, biologically, psychologically, and you put them in sort of the right settings. So not a lot of people have ghostly encounters at their dentist office, right? 
<laughs> why is that? Why isn't there hundreds of reports of stuff at their dentist office or the right. DMV? Why is the DMV oh. never haunted, right? Right. Uh, sometimes the setting plays a role in it too. And that's just, that's not like an, um, a skeptical or materialistic view of it. It's just the setting plus the person uh, kind of mixes together to cause a, a, a paranormal or ghostly encounter. Interesting. So, but isn't that like poltergeist activity caused by like telekinesis? Isn't that what they also would say also like poltergeist? Because for me, my, my understanding of a poltergeist is just, um, you know, caused by a 13, 14 year old, you know, a teenager, so, you know, girl. Yeah that's going through puberty or going through something traumatic and can cause glasses to break and things that, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, you know, her, she's like just so pumped, but that's what I always thought a poltergeist was. But then mm -hmm. wouldn't you put that in the same category as telekinesis then? Um, not necessarily. I, I think it's very challenging because, you know, what's the difference between a poltergeist and a haunting? phenomenon wise well i don't think a haunting to me i don't think like for me a haunting is is um knocks on woods you might see a shadow um hear laughter hear someone call your name you know things happening around the house that you can live with you know uh, and would to me would be caused by whatever we can't see, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, you know, <laughs> paranormal ghosty or yeah, that's phenomena, fine. some phenomena that's happening that, you know, maybe it's another dimension. Maybe it's another, maybe we're the ghosts, <laughs> you know, like, the, you know, who knows? Um, so that's the difference to me. Like I think pol a polar guys is more human mind created. Yes. Yeah. Um, if, if we're looking at, if, if you're viewing poltergeist is more caused by the individual, like a psychological, so energy from outside of us, whether that's psychological, whatever, impacts the environment and then stuff's moving and stuff like that. Is that kind of what you're saying? Um, yeah. Like, I mean, if, I mean, like if, if, if somebody if like a poltergeist to me would, is more coming from the person, you know, and moving stuff and breaking stuff and, you know, they don't know they're doing it, mm -hmm. you know, so, and they think it's a, they think it's haunting. They do think it's a haunting, right? And then, yeah. then you do like for me, a haunting would be take the person out of it, even though you need the people mm -hmm. to create it. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not being caused by the person. You know what I'm saying? Like, yep. And, and I think for me personally, what I look at is sort of the symptoms or the phenomenon, right? So in in haunted houses. And on hauntings, you have subjective and you have objective phenomenon that's happening. So subjective is like a feeling I get. Only I know that feeling when I walk into a room and I feel overwhelmed with sadness for no apparent reason. That's like, it's like a subjective haunt type phenomenon. And then you have objective stuff like objects moving, um, teleporting across the room, um, dishes flying all over the place. You, you see that stuff in hauntings all the time. Uh, I'm, you know the Hinsdale House, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, the Hinsdale House has numerous uh, objective phenomena and stuff flying all over the place. Um, uh, faucets turning on and off for no apparent reason. Um, uh, I don't have my notes in front of me, but there's numerous other objective things that happen there. So for me, personally, what I do is I, I look at sort of the haunt type phenomenon that's going on. And then I, 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 I try to just figure out it gets confusing when you try to find the cause. So um, like uh, objective phenomenon is caused by the person. Uh, haunting phenomenon is caused by an external entity. Um, it's tough to really conclusively say it's internal or it's external. Right. So uh, from my perspective, and I, I've listened to numerous, I've just listened to numerous um, uh, presentations by some of the top people on in the field in pair in parapsychology on poltergeist activity so i don't discount like that psycho 
kinetic or psychokinesis agent type thing that you're talking about. But for me, all I, I try to do if when I go into a haunting location is, can, is there anything that's going on that I can sort of correlate with um, environmental data? So like a if you have a, a child's toy in a room, if the child's toy moves, um, when that thing moved, did anything change in the environment? Like did EMF go up or down? Did ion counts change? Did something happen? So for me, it's more about correlating that with um, coordinating correlating uh, a haunt type phenomenon, a subjective or objective, with some sort of environmental thing that's going on in, around somebody or around right. the environment. Yeah. Um, so if when I try to look for causes, I get bogged down. I'm like, oh, it could be this. It could, it could be a thought form. It could, could be a poltergeist. It could be a haunting. It could be um, a spirit. It could be a, a demon. It could so then my brain just goes like in a hundred different miles. And I have to really just focus on does this phenomenon, is there some way, is there any part of that data that I can correlate with EMFs or something and, and say, oh, this, we have three data points. We have this person saying they saw a ghost. We have an object moving and we have EMF going up or down, whatever. So for me, that's what I look at, but I'm not a poltergeist right. researcher. I'm, that's not really my field um, no. that I, I don't pretend to know much about RSPK, recurrent spontaneous psychokinetic. Um, I think that's what they call it. Yeah. I, I was just, because I've, I, you know, the mind is a very powerful thing, you know? Yeah. And I mean, women, I say this all the time. I'm like, if a woman can convince themselves that they're pregnant when they're not and have all the symptoms and they really believe it, they also can convince themselves that they're not pregnant when they are, you know? And, and yep. never know till they go to the hospital and they have a, they think they have a, kidney stone and now pops a baby right i mean right. yeah we've all seen those shows yeah i i personally know somebody that went oh. through that i'm like oh wow yeah, yeah. yes I, and to me that's insane yeah i i mean i believe 100 I, I mean i agree with you our brains can do things that are amazing i think we can create things in the environment and not really know what we're doing it um you know that's why it's it's important to, I know we love labels. We love to give things labels. Like, right. you know, I, I know people who go in and say this, well, it's a demon here or it's a poltergeist or it's a haunting or it's this or it's that. Um, or it's the ghost of Joe Jane Doe who was murdered here. And I think it gets so confusing that we tend to lose focus on the actual phenomenon that's happening. Um, and, and for me, I, my brain can't do that. I can't be working on 9 million different things and causes. So I have to focus well, on. I'm just, sure. I'm sure you go down a rabbit hole. Yeah. You I, to, I mean, it's like when you start writing, it's like, oh, it could be this. And then there's like a thousand words on what that could be. And then the next thing you know, right. it's this. And there's a thousand words on what that could be. So um, I try to keep it as simple as I can. Um, how long especially you, when it comes to theories. Yeah. How long do you, how long do you spend on one particular what would you call it? A, a, a case or a, or a, a subject or. Yeah, I don't, um, you know, I'm, I'm not part of a team. I'm not, I'm not, nothing like that. Uh, we, 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 and I'll ask you, I actually have some questions for you about Hinsdale house. Um, oh, okay. we, <laughs> we, That's we my favorite in, place. Uh, yeah. Well, we, we went into Hinsdale house and, and we're kind of, we're, we're sort of writing a book. I know you had, uh, Shane, Shane on and Dave on, and I think Don too, Molnar. Yes. Um, we all went together to Hinsdale house and we've been trying to get a book together. And honestly, we went in in April of last year and we're just crunching the numbers and doing all the data. We had a questionnaire that uh, 272 people completed. So there's just a lot of data to crunch on that. Um, I have a really good EVP from there. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I, how long are you taking a case? I don't know. Um, it depends on what you do. If you're crunching all the data and listening to everything, um, maybe a, a couple months to do yeah. all that. Yeah. Um, you know, this is taking longer because we're trying to put it in written form. And um, so, but. Um, so I don't know what Dave, do you know Dave and Tim very well? I know Dave pretty well. I don't know Tim very well. Look what Dave said. I'm going to beat his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. 
Um, so you went to Hinsdale House. What did you think of it? Tell me your thoughts. So, first of all, there were some things. I, I experienced some things there that um, I haven't anywhere else. Um, I loved it. It's now my number one most favorite place that I've been. I can't count Gettysburg. Gettysburg is in a category by itself. And mm -hmm. I go there so much. So I have so many experiences there. So I can't, I can't really, it's not counted. Anyway, Hinsdale, um, actually I fought going for two to, two to three years. I fought going. And finally my, my peaches were like, you're going with us. So I went, I was afraid to go because I heard all this stuff about it, you know, that it was negative, that it was this, you know, that, you know, yeah, no, I heard that stuff too. I don't know. Yeah, so I didn't want to go because I don't want anything to do with anything like that. Yeah. So I finally go, and I'm telling you, it was the best experience I had to date. Um, they, my my peaches actually went to dinner, and I stayed behind by myself for two and a half hours and just walked around with a recorder, was trying to communicate, you know, doing just stuff like that. Never, I've never done that before. I didn't think I'd be able to do it. Yeah. Um, but there were some strange things that happened. Um, they're all on record because I don't shut my recorder off. I leave my recorder going 24 seven. Okay. So I have a lot, I have almost everything on record. Um, there was something that happened outside that I believe it to be a, that I saw a bear. Um, I have never been that scared in my entire life, uh, but I did, I do think it was a bear. Other people are telling me that they don't know what it was. They saw it for longer. Cause I saw it and I kid you not tears came out of my eyes. My butt cheeks clenched and I ran into the house so fast. Yeah. I like literally pushed my friends out of the way to get into the house. Like I was so that scared. Um, it looked, it was a large animal. It was very big. So my only conclusion was that it was a bear. I didn't stick around long enough to see. The It wasn't a deer because I don't believe a deer would be coming towards us. This thing was walking towards us like it wasn't scared, you know? And that's what scared me. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so um, the girls outside said that they saw two different things and they were wispy and this and that, but I cannot say that, that, that I saw that. Um, also, um, we heard what sounded like we were like laying down. Two girls were sleeping in the front bedroom, that first bedroom when you first walk in and we were, the rest of us were in the living room and um, it sounded like somebody got up and walked into the kitchen and we had a bunch of um baskets all everywhere with food in it and stuff and you could hear paper rustling so we thought it was one of the, our one of the other two girls walking and stopping to get something out of a basket and was going to come into the living room so none of us really reacted we were just waiting for somebody to come in and then nobody came in so then we were like kim dana and they were sleeping in the bedroom. Yeah. So that was strange. Yeah, I've heard a couple of people talk about footsteps in the kitchen. That yeah. seems to be a common that and and that I, I don't know. I, see, I get I have ADD really bad. So when I get taken around places and, and and they do the history tours or they walk us around and they say whatever, I I never obtain that information. <laughs> I don't know why I just don't. So it, it does. I don't remember the names of, I don't remember the names of the rooms, the people that were there the, and nothing. So, and, and anybody that's investigated with me can contest to this. I mean, attest to this because I asked the same, I asked questions. They're like, we already talked about this. <laughs> like, <it's, laughs> um, so I didn't know that, but um, I promise you hand on the Bible it sounded like somebody walked into the kitchen and none of us were really even, we weren't even thinking about, it, but we all thought somebody walked, you know, we, after we realized it wasn't anybody, we all said to each other, like, I thought that was Kim or Dana. 
so we weren't like talking about it. We weren't discussing it. It was, it was like, we weren't paying attention. Things were happening. Hmm. We have, um, what, what do you, what do you think? What are, what are your thoughts? Like, is this, is this like a ghost? Is this like a, a mouse? What, what do you think? Not a mouse. Yeah, no, I'm just, I just using that as an example. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I honestly, I mean, I know what I heard. I'm not crazy. Yeah. No, yeah. You, you know what I mean? So I, I can't explain. I don't know how it happened. Yeah. So th th that's the important part. Like it's sometimes focusing on just the phenomenon and not trying to come up with this is what it is. Right. Um, this, the experience you had was um, haunt type phenomenon or paranormal or ghostly encounter. Uh, and it sounds like you didn't really focus too much on, well, it's a poltergeist or it's whatever. So that's great. I mean, what? Yeah, why that's, do you think, that's why? the thing. Like, so when you're when you're not focused on it, if you're not sitting there asking questions and you're you know doing an investigation, you've lost that opportunity to try and figure out because you don't realize what's happening. Like we didn't know. We just assumed it was one of us, you know, and and. Before we realized it wasn't time. I mean, I have it all on record on the recorder. You know what I mean? Like you can hear us like go, wait, him, Dana? Cause then I was like, where are they coming in here? Like, what are you guys doing? You know, like yeah. I mean, I, it was just crazy. It's I mean, the thing about the Hinsdale and it, so we did a questionnaire and we sent it out to I, I already forgot the number, 272 people that went there. Um of those 272 people, 90% uh, of people had an experience in that location. Yeah. So that's a high number. Um, so it's it's one of those locations that... Um, Odd things We happen. talk about like the right setting. Yeah. Um, it's one of those locations that for some reason induces experiences, right? So when we talk about right people, right setting, why is this house inducing experiences whereas other houses aren't inducing experiences um so, the, the, so why do you think one house is haunted and another is not what what is the genesis of a haunting because uh, you've been you've talked to many people you've been in the field for a little while um why is what causes a haunting in a house and anyone can answer this in the the chat too what, yeah. what causes this i think i i honestly think it has, I think it's everything. I think everything. I mean, I think it's the land. I think the land holds stuff. I think structures hold. I want to say energy, but I don't want to say energy because Kenny busts my balls when I say energy. He, he busts my balls when he say energy, but oh. it holds stuff, you know? Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, Hinsdale, they, there's, there's Indian history there. Um, there's also unmarked graves there that they don't know who's there. Sure. Um, there's, I mean, it's it's got a lot of history. Okay? And, and, and I feel like places like that, I don't know how it captures it, but it, it, it captures it. And whether or not it's intelligent, that's a different story because... I mean, I've been in places where we've been doing EVP sessions or not, and I hear things with my ear. I'll hear answers or I hear words and it's caught on the recorder. Yeah. You know, nobody else hears it. How do you explain that? Or or what, how, how does that happen? Is it, I mean, it's caught on the recorder. So something is being, you know, it's not just me thinking I'm hearing it. Yeah. Yeah. I, and again, I, I, I'm not discounting any of your, your Oh, no, no. Here. I know you're not. Yeah. Like, this is <laughs> I, I'm just, like... I'm kind of wondering, like with your experience and with your numerous um, investigations and, and um, being to numerous haunted locations, it's like, what is the consistent factor in all these locations? What, what causes Hinsdale to be such an, an, an experience inducing situation? It sounds like you think there's something that's sort of, sort of that, um, 
stone tapey type theory where it's something was burned into the environment and it's sort of replayed or people who are sensitive enough can pick up on it and and get the 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 phenomenon that's happening does that sound like some some okay. um because i think i i believe that a place can have both they can have the natural recording but they mm -hmm. also can have intelligent um whatever that intelligence is i don't know i mean because each location that i've gone to like i'll use selma mansion for example because selma i investigated eight times before i had an experience mm -hmm. where people they say all the time they have experiences but for me i i mean i went i investigated eight times and then i had an experience and i don't know if you know, if it's the people that are going there and doing these investigations that are imprinting things there. Um, because every location, I do find that the more isolated locations tend to have a little bit more. Okay. All right. Um, I'll say that because when I go to Gettysburg, the less traveled spots tend to be a little bit more active. Yeah. Where everybody goes to Devil's Den. Everybody goes a little round top. You know, when you go to the places that people don't go to and it's real quiet, tends to be like, you know, you get, get more EVPs, you get more activity, you get more things happening. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and the invest and the paranormal ghost believer in me says, well, you know, they're lonely and they don't have anybody to talk to. Everybody's going to all these other places. So, yeah, they want to talk <laughs> to us. <laughs> you know? But, I mean, I, I think. Uh, we all have these sort of perceptions and these ideas when we yeah. walk into locations about what makes this place haunted. And, you know, I, early in my career, it was more like what, why do some people have ghostly encounters and other people have none? Um, and now I'm switching over to why are some locations haunted and others not? What, why are there so many experiences at these locations? I think you mentioned history. Um, I, that seems to be a common thing that I hear from people. Um, but as we know, in the 1800s, um, like cemeteries didn't really exist until I think the mid 1800s. People were buried on their property all the time. It was yep. common. It was actually what you did. Right. Um, so there's numerous houses with people, people kind of buried in the backyard. Um, and as far as Native Americans, they traversed all through America, Ohio, wherever, Hinsdale's in New York, so I'm sure they were there. So there's numerous houses like that. And even around Hinsdale, if you've been there, there's the house up on the hill, and then there's, I can't remember specifically, but there's houses all around that area. Like what makes Hinsdale so so special? Why is that such an experience? So th these are the things that kind of ponder. And you, I mean, you answered the questions, um, uh, the, the kind of your perspective on that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fascinating too. Um, not so much about why is this place, what's different about this place, what traps the energy, if, if, if that's kind of how you want to. I think it. each place has its own story. Like I could tell you what, how I feel about Gettysburg. I, I mean, I think Gettysburg, because a lot of people go there and always say, well, you know, oh, it makes me so sad. And, 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 and for me, it's the most peaceful place on earth. Like I could go there, it recharges my battery. I, I want to move there. Right. Yeah, yeah. And there's people that are like, I can't even, I can't go there, you know? And I, and I say, you know, for me, it's, you know, um, you almost feel like I'm also a very patriotic person. So for me, this is on that level, you know, I feel like this is the heartbeat of our nation. Right. So when I go there, it's not only, you know, I, I, I I'm, I'm respecting and honoring our, you know, the, those who fought in the war, but also then that's what I'm saying. Like, I think that they're the, the stuff that you experience there, obviously, not obviously, but the residual is going to be happening. I mean, a lot of times you, that's mostly what you hear people say, like, oh, I saw a hospital scene happening. There were doctors operating on a soldier or there was a whole regiment walking across the field, you know, you know, in carrying the battle flags and this and that. And then they weren't there. But then you have people that experience intelligence stuff, meaning 
you ask a question, you hear an answer, you know, and I feel like they're there because they love being, they, they, they're, they're, we keep them there again. There, it goes back to people for me. Like we're, are coming there. People travel there. Millions of people travel there a year to honor the people that fought in the civil war to see the fight in this night. So I feel like that kind of brings that energy there because they love being honored. They yeah. love being honored. Yeah. And, and I think you bring up a lot of great points too. You know, you mentioned you meant you went to that one place numerous times and you only had an experience on the eighth time you went there or something like mm -hmm. that. Right. So to me, it's like, and, and I'll get back to the Gettysburg point too, is, you know, what was different that time you had the experience? Right. right? Was it like, was there something emotionally different for you that day? My dog was with me. Okay. So, yeah. So th this idea of sometimes when we enter a location, we for tend to forget that um, we're human beings and we're in us is contained a lot of emotions, um, uh, distress, dis-ease, stress. Sometimes it's calmness. Sometimes it's happiness. Sometimes it's immersion into the environment. So when we walk into a location, we're bringing all that stuff in there with us. So when we bring all that stuff in there with us, perhaps that has something to do with why we have experiences and not. So if I walk into a location and I'm extremely, um, I don't know, sad or depressed or angry or um, overwhelmed and I have a experience, maybe that says emotions have something to do with the perception of the paranormal or sigh or something along those lines. Maybe there's something that's triggered where we're more open when that when we're like that. Um, you know, if we walk into a location and, you know, we're I said anger before, but when we walk in and we're distressed, maybe we right. have a maybe when we walk in and we're angry and we're tired and we just don't want to be there, we don't have that experience. So maybe there is something that we bring to the location or emotionally that makes us more attuned to a location. Right. So it, when you go to Gettysburg, you have a, a specific connection to it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like going, if I go back to my old high school right? and I bring you with me, I go into that high school and I have all kinds of memories, good and bad. <laughs> I, there's smells that are triggered. Yeah. There's certain places that in my brain, there's all kinds of shit firing. And I'm just like, oh my God, this brings back sort of the ghosts of my past life. Yeah. You walk into that high school, none of that happens for you, right? Right. We're in the same location. Objectively, we should be getting the same feelings and experiences, but we're not because the place memory for me is a little different. Right. I'm more immersed in that environment. I'm more attached to it. I have past experiences there. So my brain is already different from yours walking into my high and, school. And that's uh, that's a good that's a good way to put it. I've I've always explained it to like I always thought we have different antennas you know and your your frequencies over here you know your antennas you know picking up all this and mine's not working well so we're like on different frequencies or we're you know on different wavelengths or something like that you know like your antennas but I like the way that you put it mm -hmm. yeah it's it's an environment can can impact us to the core my old high school could impact us, me to the core. Um, certain places where I had positive memories or negative memories, certain locations that look like places I've had positive or, memory or negative memories can really impact me um, psychologically, which yep. could impact me biologically. Um, you know, so when we bring these stuff to a locations, I think we, we, we all kind of think we're robots and we can go in objectively and do what we got to do. And I think when we turn that off, we lose some of the core stuff that may trigger the experiences, elicit the experiences, um, or, or sort of be sort of connect to it in some way. And that could be genuine experiences or sort of like um, thought forms that you talk about. Um, I, you know. I, I question everything for me, you know, like yeah. I, it's, it's even, even an example you know, cause my biggest thing is I can hear answers, you know, and, or hear, you know, when they're, when they say things or, you know, when I say they, 
it's just for lack of better description. <laughs> but um, I don't even know where the hell I was going with that now. <laughs> See my day. And I think, but I think that's a good, you know, lack of better description. So I think the word energy is used a lot. Yeah. Um, for, for people who aren't physicists, um, encapsulating what's going on in the environment is a challenging thing to do. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I can't explain uh, subatomic particles, uh, neurons, protons, these types of things. So for me, when when the word energy is used, it's it's people who are kind of just describing the environment that's around them. Yeah. And and how they sort of vibe with it or feel with it. So, you know, if you ever walked into a room, I've been in psychology my whole life. I used to work in EJRs. Sometimes you could walk in a room and just feel. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know, if I walk yeah. into a room after a big argument or I walk into a room after someone's been crying for a couple hours or there's some yeah. sort of distressful situation that happens, even if I don't know what's happening, sometimes the environment just feels a little different. Yeah. Um, and it's OK not to have like a super specific scientific scientific particle physicist analysis of the ions in the room that are going on because we're not all we're not all physicists right so we can describe things as being energy and that's okay yeah it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> thank you <laughs> well i mean that, that's just it i mean for for a lot of people i i think energy is a way for them to sort of just describe um what's going on around them yeah we all get bad vibes and i've met some people i just get bad vibes from yeah um, it's like a bad energy from somebody yeah, yeah. and that's how i describe it yeah um, just like with love you know there's no scientific way there's no blood test there's nothing like that to determine if someone loves somebody else but we use this this term quite often um there's no way to prove it scientifically um i've heard numerous skeptics say they love somebody and i say we'll prove it and they can't <laughs> because it's just right. a word you describe how you feel um, so energy is the same way. Um, if, if, if you're, if, I, I always sort of, if we, don't, <laughs> if we don't have the words to describe something, it's okay yeah. to use a, a word that's kind of familiar to us. Yeah. And energy is familiar to us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am going to put Samantha's comment up there, but I, kn I know where I was going. I was going to say like, for me, um, I'm afraid of clowns. So, everybody goes to this clown motel, right? To investigate it. Everybody's heard of the clown motel and they go there. I won't go there because I know what's there. I know I won't be able to investigate because I'll be too afraid of my environment. You know what I mean? So I won't go there. So I always like to know what I'm walking into because of that reason. Like I understand there's going to be places that people like to investigate like that. You know what I mean? But not for me. So I won't go to the cloud motel for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, your, that's what you bring into the environment. Well, that was going by like what you said about if you're going into a place where and you're sad or you're angry or whatever, you know, if I know I'm going to a clown motel and there's gonna be clowns everywhere already, I'm like, F this, <laughs> you know, I'm like, what am I insane? But then there's people out there that love clowns exactly. and they love like Pennywise and you they know, would insane. love it's crazy. They would love to be in a, a hotel room surrounded right. by creepy porcelain dolls. No. So they just have a different feeling and vibe when they walk into that room. Exactly. Um, and so I that think makes that, sense. Th th that's out there. We all have different perspectives and sociocultural influences and interests. And uh, when we walk into a room, we're all experiencing if we walk, all walk, walk into the same room or house or building, we're all experiencing it differently. Uh, perceptually, physically, sensory wise, we smell different things. When my wife walks into Sherwin Williams, she sees 900 colors. I see five. Uh, <laughs> well, so men are just not, you guys do not pay attention to detail. That's all. But, but that's what I'm saying. Like, we have a totally different experience in the yeah. same location. Uh, and, and when right. we, when we do investigations or ghost hunting or anything in our in our lives, we have to really take into account that aspect of things, what we bring into an environment. You see this? This is how nice they are to me. There is a video of me running from a clown. Yes, there is. Uh, yeah. I was on all fours running under tables. 
that's what was happening. <laughs> that's scary. Um, so I don't know. I know I took her thing down, but that was interesting. Like, um, she said, I wanted to make sure. How much do you think is basic human empathy versus energy? And that was when we were talking about walking into a room if there was like, you know, distress or fight, uh, argument that just happened. Or, I mean, I think about this when you walk into, but see, you already know you're going to a funeral. If you were just to walk into, but you're right. If you just walk in, if there was like a, you walk into a bar where there was just a bar fight, <laughs> right. you know, something just went down and you're like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, when you think empathy, empathy means, you know, what's happening. Right. right? Uh, um, so if I don't know what's happening in a room, I don't know if you've ever been over like somebody's house and then you have like, you walk into a room and it's just, you can tell that the, that the other couple was true. arguing or yeah. there's something going on. And I don't know if, you know, you know, I guess you can say maybe there's subtle body language, but, but sometimes it just feels like, feel it. yeah, they always say you can cut the tension with a knife, but the yeah. environment just feels a little different. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I don't know if there's any, uh, like specific research that says people can determine that type of thing. Yeah. But I, I know based on my experience in psychology is sometimes you could, you can just feel um, things. Yeah. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, so I, you know, I, I, I know there's probably some research out there that's looked into this before. I just can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, so your book, mm -hmm. um, which I'm going to buy now. Well, good. Um, oh yeah. You know what? Hold on. Hold that thought. So do you know, you know, oh, you do know Don. You said you were at Hinsdale with him. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Don. I love, I love Doc. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a nice guy. Um, um so your book, mm -hmm. um, Tell us about, like we started to talk a little bit about, you said it was a little, you said it was a, a lot with um, uh, crisis apparitions. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the yeah, crisis apparitions are a big part of it. Um, you know, it's, uh, so the book is called The Ghost Studies. Um, and, and I wrote it, I think it came out in 2017. Um, but uh, you know, for me, it's, yeah, I spent several years sort of gathering as many first -hand, account, first hand accounts of ghostly encounters that I could. Uh, I read book after book on ghostly encounters. Uh, I kind of listened to people talk about ghosts for a long periods of time, conventions, things like that. Um, I started noticing some similarities amongst the majority of these encounters. Uh, and it kind of led me to come up with some new hypotheses and ideas on what ghosts could be outside of the, the you know, um, discarnate entity with unfinished business. Um, so I, I wrote the ghost studies and I came up with a kind of, like I said, a new, some several hypotheses on what it could be. I kind of linked it with uh, telepathy. I linked it with um, emotions. And I basically say that, you know, ghostly encounters are a mixture of uh, psychological, biological, and environmental factors. Uh, they all kind of come together. Um, uh, during sometimes crisis events. And uh, I give my perspective on what I think some ghostly encounters could be specifically like hauntings and imprint theories and things like that. Um, and, you know, the book is, um, God, like I said, it's been out for a while now. And the, for me, um, you mentioned your ADHD. Um, yeah. I, I'm the farther I move away from something. So when I start taking on other projects, my brain pushes out the past stuff <laughs> does that make sense so yes. uh, i'm i'm usually like uh not the best at talking about things i did a year two years three years ago because i'm so like right now i'm engrossed in this hinsdale book and no i'm all about this i can't wait for this because hinsdale now is my favorite my most favorite place yeah it's a, a great place but unfortunately this book has just been um sucking the my brain um, <laughs> uh, so I'm so focused on that and I, yeah. some of the other recent stuff. No, well, we can talk about, let's talk about Hinsdale then. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will always talk about Hinsdale, but, um, 
yeah so but with the book anyone can buy it it's a it's 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 got some new theories on it uh i'm I, i'm getting back out, out into like the the paranormal conference world as well um so i'll oh, be good. at um the fort wayne paranormal conference in september fort um, wayne and where uh indiana oh indiana yeah, nice little, like I, I, I've never been to the West Coast. I've been there once, but just for a girls' weekend. I didn't do anything paranormal, but it, you know, it, it, you know, if you're in, if you want to head out to Indiana, go for it. Um, so it'll be a good time. It looks like yes. there's a lot of there's a lot of good speakers there. Uh, yeah, Gettysburg. I would love to go to Gettysburg. Oh my gosh, Gettysburg. you should totally come. Yeah, um, it's so fun. I, I would Dave, love Dave. to. Dave, this means you're coming because you said he must join us in Gettysburg. So that means that you're you are coming. Um, that would be you should, you should come. Just shack up <laughs> with them guys. They got room, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, well, it's 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 you know I'm trying to get back out there and I'm trying to I've done I did another one in Virginia this past a couple months ago at the Hanover Tavern in Virginia, which was really fun. Um, when I gave a talk a little bit about crisis apparitions. Um, so That's awesome. if you're interested in crisis apparitions, like we talked about, um, you know, the book's a good, a good starting point for that. Um, yeah. It'll point you towards some research out there as well. Yeah, I just, I've, not, never, I've never heard of that. Like to me, I mean, I've heard the stories, but I didn't yeah. know there was a category for that, you know? Yeah. Um, if, if, if please everyone look up crisis apparitions and look up the stories. Uh, there was a book that was written in the late 1800s called Phantasms of the Living, which has 600, I think it's 600 accounts of crisis apparitions. Uh, it's really a fascinating read. And um, to me, it gives the, like I said before, the, the best evidence, if you wanna say evidence for sort of um, uh, ghostly phenomenon is these spontaneous case examples because you take out suggestion. A lot of these people who have crisis apparitions have never had a paranormal experience before. Right. Um, and then when they have a paranormal experience, it coincides exactly when someone died. So the odds of that happening are pretty yeah. astronomical. Um, I, I think uh, and my math is is not hundred percent, but let's say you're um, let's say you're thirty. Uh, so if you're thirty years old, I think you've been alive for like that. thirty years old. You've been alive for like fifteen million minutes. So out of those 15 million minutes, if you had an apparition, let's say of your father, um, at the exact time he passes, that's sort of astronomical odds. Um, right. You know, it's it's tough to, to, few, to dispute things like that. So I find those crisis apparitions to be not only fun reads, but just um, pretty good data. But, but what do you? But and you don't you don't believe it is that of a. You don't think that's my dad saying bye before he leaves. Well, again, um, I know it's, I know you can't a hundred percent ever. Oh yeah. 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 Say no. Yes or no. But I mean, I, I think my stance more is that, so telepathy is this communication at a distance. So, um, you know, I, I think telepathy plays a huge part of it. when people think of telepathy, they think of one person reading another person's mind. So, if you're thinking of a number uh, and I read your mind and I pick that number as telepathy, but telepathy is actually a lot more than that. Telepathy sometimes is images, it's feelings, it's hunches, it's things like those, you know, um, there's an example of a woman who was writing a letter to her daughter. Uh, her daughter was away in college, um, states over miles away. Mm -hmm. And as she was writing the letter, she had this intense burning in her right hand. And it was so painful that she had a she dropped the pen and almost like scream. Um, and then she found out that her daughter, who was miles, hundreds of miles away, actually spilled acid on her right hand at the exact and she was in a lab um, at school in college, and she spilled acid on her hand in the same exact spot that the mom had the pain. So this is sort of telepathy. Right. The daughter is communicating her distress states over to her mom, and it's coming out in the form of physical pain. But That's there would have to be some unseen, for lack of a better term, force, if you will. 
it's, for that it has, connection to happen. Yeah, right? it has to do with what they call it is, is entanglement. Um, and I talk a lot about it in the book, but entanglement is, is kind of um, syncing up with somebody. And usually it's somebody that you're pretty close with. And when you sync up or resonate, then communication is passed more or less. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you talked about frequencies before. If, if I'm driving in my car on the radio um, and I tune my receiver to 92.3, um, when I do that, I'm matching frequencies with the radio signal 92.3, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that signal is always around me. But the only way I, I know what's going on at 92.3 is when I turn, turn the dial and I match frequencies. Right. So entanglement is really sort of matching frequencies, if you want to think about it like that. And then communication is sort of, uh, there's been some research in that. Um, I talk about some research studies that's been done where people sort of had this entanglement from over 3,000 miles away, uh, experimental type stuff where people had entanglement. So it's not far-fetched. Um, you know, it's like a cell phone um, in a way. Uh, when I dial a number, uh, how come it goes directly to you and not to some other random person, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of like a, a weird, very basic way to think about entanglement. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. So I guess you don't know when your Hinsdale book is coming out. I, I, no, uh, we're, we're still working on it. We, we're, um, we've got a lot of words. I didn't even know you guys were like, look at, well, we actually just went in September. I, we did a show about it. Yeah. I, I heard they, they forward me. It. Um, so I did watch that show with uh, me and my peaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 we did a deep dive in the, in the lore of Hinsdale. Um, like I said, the questionnaire. Um, yeah. Dave did a bunch. Dave and Shane did a bunch of like um, the EMFs and the environmental stuff. So um, I love just, Shane. Shane's awesome too. Yeah, it's it's just um, it's a just a a fascinating place, and we're just trying to figure out as much as we can. You know, the problem I, is when you get that much data, it's just tough to get it all together and put it yeah. on a piece of paper and then make it. Were there a lot of consistencies with one certain area of the place? Um, or were there a lot of all of the, cause I, I like a lot of people talk about outside, right? So mm -hmm. everybody said like, before I went, everybody was like, oh, the outside's worse than the inside. Oh, right. Yeah. So this is what I was told. Yeah. And during the day, I mean, I felt it felt great. I was like blowing huge bubbles all over the property, and like you know, we we like went up to the giving tree, and I, we we created a new one. Like we went up there, and yeah. there's this giving tree, you know, and people put stuff up there. Hang oh stuff yeah, I there. know. Yeah. So I look over and I go, "Well, that tree's kind of bare. Let's start putting stuff on this tree." So me and the peaches went, and we got a whole bunch of stuff put it on this other tree. So I was like, hopefully maybe all the trees will start to get decorated. Right. Yeah, why not? Um, so anyway, so I've never done anything like that before. And then, you know, we went down and, you know, we kind of were, they were like, cause you, you hear about the, the, the native American hi history there. So one of my girls would start playing Indian music, you know, like the drums and stuff like that while we were out by the fire. And for some reason that made me feel a little uncomfortable only because I don't know anything about it. And I know a lot of times those songs mean things, you know, um, they tell stories or they, whatever. So I was like, you know, I don't really know. I felt a little uncomfortable hmm. anyway. So that already set the tone for me outside at night with all that. And then I just did not like being where I couldn't, see what was going on around me because it's so dark so i we had to go in and get a fleer we had to get a night vision camera like and i we so we were using those as well so because if i heard mm -hmm. any little thing i was i was worried about animals sure. <laughs> or wrong term people one of the two <laughs> all right wasn't so worried about anything paranormal i was just worried about other stuff yeah and um 
I just didn't feel, com I still didn't feel comfortable out there, you know? So I wanted to go mm -hmm. back towards the house. And then that's when we saw that thing. Yeah. At, or I saw it anyway. Yeah. It's, I don't think we spent too much time outside. Um, it was this, it was the scariest thing I ever saw. I, it was an, I'll say it's an animal. I just don't know what kind of animal it was, mm -hmm. but it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> oh, sounds like it. Yeah. I it would, really did. I, I would have um, been scared as well. Yeah. When I was there in the house by myself, I didn't have anything happen that seemed out of the ordinary, you know? Um, it was when we were all together and we were cackling hens and, you know, not really paying attention to stuff and just kind of talking, things would start to happen. You know, equipment would sound upstairs. You know, I, I don't know why the place is so, because I didn't expect all that. You know, people talk a place up. So you're like, I'm going to go here and I'm not going to have anything happen. Yeah, I, I mean statistically there's a lot of experiences happening there um uh, but it's the same as like gettysburg right i mean gettysburg there's ghost stories from there and a lot of every people have stuff happen all the time there um for some reason asylums i i think a lot of the stuff comes from like you know, the stories and 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 the people going in you already have these like pre conceived you know impressions of a place yeah. there's narratives you're right 100 percent um like you said when you drove up you had this apprehension about the 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 story of the demons and the structural exorcism and um we have this narrative as we walk in um and then if we do have some sort of ambiguous stimuli or something falls even if it's natural we we can kind of automatically go right to that that one narrative that we have um so i think that plays a role in it too yeah there was something else happened that was we, we had a lot of odd things happen like the last day we were there the sheriff's department showed up now it wasn't odd for them to come like the police department to make rounds um but they got out they came you know they were starting to walk up to the house we met them and they said, is there a, um, oh my gosh, who, what, what did they say the name was? There, it was a girl's name. Um, the last name was Ballinger. I have it on, we, I have it on record because I record all the time. But so they asked for if there was a girl here by this name and we were like, no. And we said, maybe we're leaving. Maybe they're coming after us. And they, he, they said, well, they called 911 and gave us this address and it was three bear drive but it brought us here it didn't take us to there's no three bear drive in hinsdale it, it was like the strangest <laughs> conversation we've ever i was like what <laughs> like, okay yeah, yeah it that's was a so weird, weird you think so yeah weird. That wasn't the local police department. It was the sheriff's department. You know what I mean? Oh. So I don't know if the, you know, I'm, I'm assuming, because I said, wouldn't the, wouldn't the police know that there was no, if they work in this town? And then yeah. somebody was like, well, it was the sheriff's department. It wasn't the police. It was the sheriff. Oh. So they're more global. You know what I mean? Like they're not just contained to one area. So, but they were like, yeah, we put in three bear drive and it brought us here. <laughs> we're like, this isn't three bear drive and they're like well we know that but so we don't know why it brought us here like, like this whole and i have this all on, on record <laughs> like well, it was a strange they, thing i hope they found her i, feel <laughs> I know i'm like well there's i'm like i don't know what to tell you like and then i, I messaged the girl and she goes i grew up in hinsdale there's no bear drive you know like she's yeah. like i have no idea i said do you know this person's name and she said no i never heard of him yeah i don't know it was just weird yeah, that is a weird so, experience. Yeah. Well, so, that's what Hinsdale does. It sure does. And the next time you guys go, I'd love to go. I, <laughs> we're actually we'll going. We're going April. Me and the peaches are going in April because we're going to plant an apple tree and a peach tree on the property. Oh, you're going yeah. next month then? Yeah. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love it. We all collectively fell in love with it. I think oh, it's our favorite nice. place. So, nice. yeah. So, oh, good. Um, yeah, I, I had a very positive, awesome experience there. It's very relaxing, not to mention. Like, during the day, we, we sat out there by the fire, played music. We had, you know, a glass of wine and just chilled out. Yeah. For a little bit, you know, it was very peaceful. Yeah. I mean, it's a nice, it's a nice area. It's a nice rural area. Got water, pond, very serene. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's not, it's not scary driving up to it. It's not what you expect from reading some of the books and seeing some yeah. of the shows. It's not yeah. as ominous as I think it's sometimes portrayed. No, um, no, but we did have some stuff happen that, you know, I, I I'm telling you every experience, every emotion that I could have doing that, I had. So that was interesting. <laughs> well, I think I think emotions play a big part in whether people have experiences or not. Oh, for sure. So I think that that probably helps people have experiences. Yeah, for sure. Um, now I've had you for an hour and 15 minutes. I apologize. I'm sure um, you're tired. But no, I, um, I, I thank you so much for coming on. And I hope you come on again. I mean, sure. I had I had fun. I hope. Yeah, no, it's fun. I really talk a lot, and like I said, I have ADHD, so I can sometimes <laughs> go over here. And uh, you know, love you too, Gina. Um, but I'm glad you stuck with me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you must be really good at your job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, I thank you, and I look forward to the book. I hope you guys get it done. Cause I, I hope so too. Back. I yeah. Hopefully one day it'll be out there. Um, yeah, I would. I would absolutely love to. Everybody say an excellent show. Thank you, everybody. Um, I was looking forward to it. Um, but definitely, and then after the book comes out, come on again, or whenever you come on, whenever. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll, I'll take you up for that. Yeah. Sure. Definitely will. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. And um, keep in touch, please. Uh, I'm really, really interested in everything you do. So I'm happy that Dave introduced us. And maybe you'll come to Gettysburg. I would love to. Yeah. Um, that would be awesome. I know it's the it's um, some sort of conference there too, right? The Bash. Yeah. Is Gettysburg that, is that where you guys? Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah so. Sure. Um, it's you not too come. far from me, so um, no. Nope. Actually, maybe it is I. No, I it's know. it's probably for. I think it's far. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's Gettysburg. Yeah. Again, never been there. Um, it'd be nice <laughs> to take a. Been? Yeah, it'd be nice to take a long weekend and and kind of yeah. visit. Um, for sure. Visit the area and then maybe stop in and see the the bash the Gettysburg. I. I forget what it's called. Gettysburg <laughs> Battlefield Bash. No, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was that close. Was, I wasn't far off. Yeah. Yeah, no, that would be awesome. You should come. You mm -hmm. would love it. Everybody's awesome. So you'll you'll have a lot of fun. But uh thank you again. And until next time, you know, um, well I'll talk to, I'll be talking to you. So all right. But I will talk to you soon. All right. Thank thanks. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm-hmm.